Tonight, the Dallas Police Department has named three suspects in the shooting death of a witness in the trial of police officer Amber Geiger. It's one of several developments tonight as fallout from the conviction of the former police officer continues to roll in. Yes, ma'am. Police are filing capital murder charges against three men accused of shooting and killing Joshua Brown. <sighs> Brown broke down on the stand after saying he heard a commotion before Amber Geiger pulled the trigger and fired killing Botham Jean. Now Brown is the victim. Joshua Brown was shot two times in his lower body. One was a through and through and the other entered his body just below the spine, traveled upward, damaging vital organs. Two of the men charged remain on the loose. We as the police department need your help in capturing the two fugitives that are not in custody. Um, we've partnered with our federal partners and we're in pursuit of them as I speak. These suspects are to be considered dangerous because they're armed. Police say the motive appears to be drugs. We executed a search warrant at Mr. Brown's apartment where we confiscated 12 pounds of marijuana, 143 grams of THC cartridges, and four thousand dollars in cash. Earlier, attorney Lee Merritt, who represents the family of Botham Jean and the family of Joshua Brown, tweeted, the state knew Joshua Brown didn't want to testify due to concerns for his safety. He flew to California when the trial began. They threatened him with jail if he didn't return. He went straight from the airport to the court. Dallas County has a duty to protect him. They failed. Then Merritt pointed to video of the judge whispering she was surprised Brown even showed up. It's hard to hear, so we'll play it again. Police didn't name Merritt directly, but did issue this general rebuke. As you know, there's been speculation and rumors that have been shared by community leaders claiming that Mr. Brown's death was related to the Amber Geiger trial and somehow the Dallas Police Department was responsible. I assure you that is simply not true. And I encourage those leaders to be mindful of their actions moving forward because their words have jeopardized the integrity of the city of Dallas as well as the Dallas Police Department. The judge who handled the Geiger case is also defending her decision to hug the defendant. Judge Tammy Kemp tells the Associated Press that she would not deny Amber Geiger the hug Judge Kemp says the defendant herself requested. The judge added that she gave the hug and the Bible to the defendant, not part as an official act. The judge's conduct has resulted in a complaint from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Meanwhile, authorities have released this new mugshot of Geiger, who is now in a women's prison in Gatesville, Texas, about midway between Dallas and Austin. She is beginning to serve her sentence. Our guests tonight are Imran Ansari and Linda Kenny Baden here all together tonight. So Imran, what do you make of the criticism of the judge here? She's saying, look, this wasn't an official act. I did this because the defendant asked for a hug. Do your defendants ask for hugs from judges and what do judges say? Well, I haven't personally had a, an experience where a client has asked for a, a hug from the judge, maybe some leniency from the judge, but not a hug. Um, I think this is sort of a, a situation where a public official like a judge has to balance uh, their actions in the public perception, especially on a case, on a trial that gains so much publicity. So here, perhaps on a personal level, this judge is providing uh, Geiger a hug, giving a Bible, but that's going to open up to criticism, obviously, uh, and it has, and it's the balancing of a judge when they are in official capacity, uh, their personal beliefs, as opposed to their duty on the bench. Exactly. Linda Kenny Baden, uh, let me ask you about this defendant, or, or I shouldn't say defendant, this witness right. in Amber Geiger's case, shot and killed. Right. We heard that over the weekend, and now we have these three named suspects. One is under arrest, two are on the loose, and this back and forth between attorney Lee Merritt, who was on this broadcast right. last night, and the Dallas Police Department. Should Dallas police have provided more protection for a witness who had already been shot once before? Apparently, he feared for his safety. That's what 
the right. attorney right. saying, and, and Dallas police, according to the attorney, didn't provide it. Dallas police saying, don't blame us. This was something out of our control completely. Here, here's the problem. We don't know whether why he was shot. Yes, could it be just a drug deal? Absolutely. But the problem is that people that don't believe it aren't going to believe the Dallas PD. That's why you need an independent agency. I actually retweeted Lee Mayer because I think you need an independent agency to come in and give us the, the, the true facts here that maybe someone believe well, this conspiracy theory, it's going to stay and play in the media forever because no one's going to believe that there was a coincidence. It's one of these things where even if there isn't a conflict, the, the mere appearance of a conflict ought to be enough. And Imran, you're agreeing with, with the chain of thought that I'm, I'm asking Linda about here, that look, just avoid the appearance, even if there really isn't one. Right. When the question's out there, and again, this is such a public case, such a public set of uh, events here, if there's a question and there's nothing to hide and there's no, no, you know, nothing is off, then just get it over with, get it out there, appease everyone, and let's move on. We all agree, and we're sitting Amazing. in the same room together. Amazing, exactly. Amazing. Let's move on now. Victim impact statements. In the case of the so-called Hollywood Ripper, we're going to go there next. The jury in August, of course, convicted defendant Michael Gargiulo of killing two women and attacking a third in the Los Angeles area. Authorities say his crime spree included a total of 11 women and that it stretches back to Illinois. The purpose of the penalty phase of this case is to determine whether the defendant should be sentenced to death or be sent to prison without the chance for parole involving those California cases on your screen. The defense says either way, Gargiulo will surely die in prison. The mother of victim Ashley Ellerin testified what it was like to find out that her daughter had been murdered. Out to my knees on the floor, and I started I started crawling around the bedroom on my hands and knees like an animal, screaming. And I was like trying to tell my husband to get away from me, like stay away from me, take it back, take it back, take it back. That's what I was yelling. I'm just empty without her. I'm sick to my stomach because she was mutilated to death. Oh, I always remember her every day. She was a very talented artist. She was admitted to UCLA at the fine arts program. You know, I, I feel so blessed to have had her as my daughter. I couldn't have asked for any more, more of a beautiful person. She was exquisite and a magnificent young woman. Ellerin's father also spoke about his loss. The loss you go through the rest of your life after losing a child, it's just not meant to be that way. The, the loss is profound. It, it broke my wife and um, my son, it was a person-by-person person devastating exercise of sharing, sharing this news. I know that when I shared it with my parents who were living in Florida, my dad died two years later. He just was a broken grandfather. There was not a service. We have her ashes and could not see putting her at rest with those ashes until justice had been served. The first of Michael Gargiulo's alleged victims was Trisha Picaccio. She was found murdered in front of her home in the suburbs of Chicago in 1993. Gargiulo is expected to stand trial for her death in Illinois. Still, Picaccio's mother was able to give a victim impact statement in this proceeding from California. Took my daughter away forever. It makes it very difficult to think of what would or could have been because she was such a sweet, wonderful, kind. It's been 26 years. Every single day I think about her. Every single day. I would say, Trisha, I know that you know that I'm fighting for you. Then you know that I love you and all of our family loves you. Her brothers, her sisters, her cousins, they all that knew her, love her. And I just hope that from up in heaven that she knows all the cousins that were born since then and all her, and her nieces and nephews that she never got to know that they're going to know about her. Victim Trisha Picaccio's younger brother, Doug, also spoke. He was friends with the defendant when they were kids and 
grew up down the street from him. 17 years old, uh, it felt like my life was over. I felt like I couldn't make sense out of things. I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to say or what I was supposed to do. What, I, what do you get out of bed for? How do you process this? How do you even begin to think about finding joy in your life again? How do you allow yourself to be happy and find joy without feeling guilty? How do you tamp down the fear and the anger? Um, it took me many, many years, to, and, I, and I had to consciously make up my mind that I was going to not allow this to destroy my life. Here's how the state set the stage for this phase of the proceeding. Mr. Gargiulo has led a life of crime and violence and has left a swath of death, grief, and destruction behind him. He has earned and deserves the maximum penalty of death and not the minimum penalty of life without the possibility of parole. And make no mistake about it, there are no less than 11 different women who have become the target and have been targets of Mr. Gargiulo's violence. Mr. Gargiulo's life work is quite literally to viciously attack women and his portfolio contains attacks on 11 different women. The defense started its opening statement by expressing personal sympathy on behalf of the attorneys for the defense for the victim's families. And then the defense asked for a sentence of life without parole. Just want you to understand that if we were to stop right now, your verdicts that you've rendered guarantee that Mr. Gargiulo will die in prison. So really the question that is being asked for you to decide is not a minimum and a maximum. It is Mr. Gargiulo is going to die in prison. The question is when? Is it going to be in God's time or is it going to be in your time. Let's go back to the panel for some discussion on this case. Linda Kenny Bodden, what did you make of the tactic of the defense attorneys basically saying, we feel sorry for the families of the victims, and then jumping in with that argument we just heard? Well, you know what? You have to express sorry for the, sorrow for the families of these victims, especially, you know, Aaron, let's, let me tell you that when I picked up the long crime story on Gargiulo and I saw his face in it, I had to like rip ripped that segment off because he scared the living daylights out of me. He was so evil. The evil came out. But just having, oozing through the screen at you and, and, and you're a defense attorney. And I'm a defense attorney. But having said that, I mean, let's face it, he is going to die in jail whether he gets the death penalty or not. Right now we have a moratorium in California anyhow, so it doesn't really matter whether, whether they give him life or not. Well, that could obviously change. And there we see those 11 victims all being brought into this. Some raped, some threatened, some killed. Imran Ansari, the graphics make the case a lot of times. The prosecution saying, look, this is a dangerous guy. The state saying he deserves the ultimate punishment. Right. I mean, it's, there are horrific crimes. The victim impact statements were incredibly compelling. Uh, you know, I'm listening. I'm sit sitting here in the studio. I'm listening to that. Uh, the father, uh, you know, testifying about his daughter. I'm getting choked up. So you can imagine if you're a jury seeing all the, uh, the uh, evidence before you, the exhibits, the state's argument, you know, you're going to feel uh, you're not going to feel a lot of sympathy for this guy. So not at all. It is what it None. is. Not at all. So, Linda, I have to ask a legal point here. The victim in the Illinois case right. testifying in the California right. case, and we haven't even had an Illinois trial yet. I know California has very strong victims' rights laws, and that's right. probably why that happened. There hasn't even been a conviction in Illinois. 
doesn't matter because it's this evilness that they're allowed to consider whether he's evil and that shows that he is evil whether it's convicted or not. And again, a lot of this is set by statute and I right. think by constitution as well in California. And California is very strict. They're also, also lenient a little bit in the sense of what does come in as an alternate crime that hasn't been proven. What's on the page, the black letter law influences these proceedings. And still ahead tonight here on the Law and Crime Network, we're going to go back to the trial involving the murder of a Florida law professor. The defense attacks the state's theory surrounding wiretap phone calls. Are the discussions the jury heard really innocent talk? That case when we return. And now to testimony in the Florida trial involving power, money, gangs, and an on-again, off-again couple accused of murdering a law professor. The victim in this case, Dan Markell, was in a tense custody battle with his ex-wife, Wendy. Prosecutors say that battle was a potential motive for murder. Neither the ex-wife nor her relatives have been charged, and the ex-wife seen here testified with immunity that she had no knowledge of a plan to kill her ex-husband. The defendants in this case are Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine Magbanawa. Magbanawa blames Garcia, and Garcia says he didn't do it. Those two are on trial, but there are three defendants in this case. Luis Rivera cooperated with authorities and took the stand. He says on the day of the murder, he and Sigfredo Garcia followed Dan Markell as Markell drove from a daycare to a gym. The defense struck back at federal wiretaps, which prosecutors say implicate the defendants. The defense suggested other gang members could have been involved in this shooting. I did not investigate 
that association I talked to the Miami FBI and Miami ATF about their investigation. And you indicated on direct examination that Mr. Rivera is currently serving a federal RICO sentence, correct? That's correct. The RICO in this case is the Latin King Association. That's the reference that's being made in his federal indictment. Is that correct? I believe so. As an FBI agent, could you call DEA or ATF and ask for their assistance? Yes, I did. And you did that in this case, correct? That's correct. And did they assist your investigation or did they hinder your investigation? Um, I guess you could say they assisted it by providing me with information. Well, let's talk about that. They showed you a copy of the indictment, correct? No, I don't believe I ever saw a copy of the indictment. Well, would you agree with me that the copy of the indictment in a federal RICO statute where Luis Rivera is a Latin king, correct? Correct. And it was a Latin king indictment, correct? There was other Latin kings indicted with it. Is that what you mean? Correct. Yes. Okay. And actually, there was roughly 19 Latin kings, including Luis Rivera, in that indictment, correct? I'll take your word for it. Okay, this time, McDonough's defense struck back at suggestions by the prosecution that money was changing hands between defendant Catherine McDonough and the brother of the victim's ex-wife. The state claims the ex-wife's family paid for a hit on the victim. That's the state's theory in this case. The defense suggested the money was a legitimate salary because defendant Catherine McDonough worked for the brother of the ex-wife of the victim. Your theory that she's getting paychecks from a place that she's not working, right? That's your theory. That's what the evidence shows. Now, the evidence you said, you're talking about the poll camera, the eight months worth of video that you took out in front of Kathy McBanlow's house, right? That's some of the evidence, correct. That's the evidence that you have that you believe that she wasn't working there because she wasn't physically going to the Adelson Institute, right? Along with her cell phone that showed she wasn't going, yes. Charles Adelson, a traveling periodontist, right? Correct. You learned that Catherine McBanlow's job for the Adelson Institute is to contact patients, right? No, I did not learn that. Yesterday, when we played Call E, you remember that, where Charles says to Catherine, did you call those patients? Okay. Do you want to hear it again? No, I believe you. You, you agree with me that there's evidence in a phone call from your <laughs> wiretaps where Charles is telling Catherine, call the patients. I agree that Charles told her a lot of things like, thanks for cleaning up on the weekend, too. Okay, on redirect, prosecutors had the FBI agent read text messages between Charlie Adelson, that's the victim's ex-wife's brother, and defendant Catherine McBanawa. From Charlie Adelson, put that you work in the office, not at home. Then response from Ms. McBanawa is no Sherlock. Then uh, Ms. McBanawa again says LOL. Then she says again, I don't know pay period dates. Can you call me? I'm driving. Mr. Adelson responds, our pay period is Monday through Monday. And that would have been an exchange that occurred after McDonald began receiving paychecks from the Adelson Institute. That's correct. Okay, our guests are back to discuss this case. Linda Kenny Budden, this is complicated. Did those text messages really refute what this, the defense was trying to get out of the, uh, the, the, uh, the FBI agent on the stand there? Uh, no, no, not at all. And, and there's no story being told. Look, McBonawa has a problem. She's got $46,000 of cash in 2014 when uh, Markel was killed, $26,000 afterwards, only $20,000 a year before. She is the only connection between the Adelsons and Dan Markel and the these two gentlemen, I'll use that term loosely, in the Latin Kings, of which she is the mother of one of their children. Okay, so tie it all together for us. So then. therefore, she's guilty of murder because she is the conduit by which they were able to deal with the flushing down the toilet of the problem. Okay, so you're making a better argument that I've heard out of the prosecutors in this case. Imran, I'm sorry, I say this is a complicated case. I'm sitting here even trying to describe it and thinking to myself, okay, you've got the ex-wife, you've got the brother, you've got the mother, you've got the father, you've got the two defendants, you've got the cooperating defendant, and it's like you have to keep all these people straight, and that's difficult. Well, actually, it's not that difficult, right? Because you have the motive there, right? You have the motive from the Adelsons and, and the ex-wife. Yeah, but look, you've got to yeah. prove every defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not just say, well, it sounds like they're up to no good. Right. Well, I think the prosecution is putting forth their best case, right? They have a cooperating witness 
through uh, Rivera. They're putting uh, the motive with Adelson's and the two the defendants, and they're doing their best at putting forward and proving this case beyond a reasonable doubt before against those two defendants. And as my esteemed co-counsel uh, Linda has said, I think both these defendants have a hard time ahead in terms of their innocence. I, I don't disagree here, but you know, you, you've got cooperating defendants. Is it possible that the cooperating defendant is lying about what's going on here, trying to like cover for other uh, alleged gang members by implicating these two? Well, that's the defense's best argument, right? That they have a cooperating witness who had a motive to lie, right? He cut a sweetheart deal with the state for pointing his the fingers at these two individuals. That's the defense case, and they're going to have to put forward that argument on summation. Yeah, and Linda, you've got two right. different defendants here. One of them is saying uh, that, the, that the other one did it, and then the other one is saying, I didn't do it at all. Uh, are these in any way congruent? Because most people might look and say that that's not in any way congruent. Well, the best the best thing the defense has is that you got a sweetheart deal of Rivera. He only really served seven years more than his RICO indictment for the Latin Kings. But the problem is, is whether he's the shooter or Sigfredo Garcia's the shooter and McBottle put them together, they both kind of like were there. Somebody killed Markel and it wasn't like the, uh, the rat running across the street. It was a real rat. In other words, a real person. A real okay, person. Linda Kenny Botten, Imran Ansari, appreciate the insights. We will keep track of that complicated case as it moves forward and keep an eye on the other trials we are watching. Hopefully a new trial starting tomorrow here on the Law and Crime Network. For now, we'll see you later on.